Today's case involves the heart-wrenching story of an adorable, bright little girl whose life was lost in the middle of a nasty battle between a family divided by international ties, a need for control, and a fear of losing what's most precious. A family where one person just wants to hurt everyone that challenges them, and another who just wants to protect her baby. And when the unfettered control that one person seeks comes crashing down, the results are absolutely devastating. But before we dive into this tragic case, I want to say a huge thank you to Nurex for partnering with me on today's video. Nurex is a digital healthcare platform that makes it easy to get the expert healthcare you deserve at every step in your skincare journey. You can work with Nurex licensed medical providers to tackle all sorts of skin concerns like acne breakouts, dark spots, hyperpigmentation, or smoothing out fine lines and wrinkles. They have over 50 clinically proven dermatologist treatments for all sorts of skin concerns that work much more effectively and efficiently than over-the-counter products. For example, retinoids are known as a powerhouse skincare ingredient, and Nurex offers retinoid treatments that are up to 20 times more potent than over-the-counter retinoids. But beyond that, the best part for me is that when you order with Nurex, they meet you where you're at. You skip the in-person appointment and you can do a medical consultation at any time that fits your busy schedule, day or night. You just share your skin history with a few photos and a Nurex provider licensed in your state will review your medical history and, if appropriate, prescribe treatment for you. Then they stay with you all throughout your journey. Nurex's team of dermatology experts will guide you through every step of the way, allowing you to adjust your medication strength to ensure you are getting the most out of your treatments. With Nurex, patients get a personalized treatment plan and a full year of unlimited messaging with Nurex dermatology expert providers and their care team. So they truly do check every box when it comes to personalized expert care. Nurex's main focus is to provide transparency and resources to make your own informed decisions about your skincare. With access to 24-7 care and support, their patients have the freedom to ask questions and get real answers when they need it most. Taking control of your health starts here. Go to Nurex.com slash Rachel Shannon or use the link in the description box below to get started. That's N-U-R-X.com slash Rachel Shannon to get started today. Results may vary and this is not offered in every state. Medications are prescribed only if clinically appropriate and consultation is required. Thank you again so much to Nurex for partnering with me on today's video. With all of that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the horrific case of Ella Aids. Ella Aids was born on November 22nd, 2015 in San Diego, California to parents Laurel Friedman and Ihan Aids. Those who knew Ella described her as being a curious little girl. She was observant and described her world in details that were far beyond what was expected for a three-year-old little girl. She loved learning and sharing her knowledge. She loved riding in the back of her mom's bicycle with her, gardening with the family, and pointing out school buses and fire trucks. Her third and last birthday was on Thanksgiving in 2018, and she spent the day with her family at Fort DeSoto Park. She had a big birthday cake with candles, building homes out of sand on the beach, and using her little imagination to pretend she was a little ant in those sand buildings. She was just such a bright, playful, imaginative little girl. Ella's father, Ihan, is originally from the country of Turkey, but had been living in the United States for the prior 20 years on a green card. Both Ihan and Laurel were known to value their education. Both attended the University of California in San Diego, with Ihan earning his doctorate degree in communication and cognitive science, and Laurel earning her master's and doctorate degrees in communication. After having Ella and graduating from school, the family moved to Istanbul, Turkey for a short period of time. But their time there didn't last due to political unrest in the country. So, they returned back to the U.S., moving to Tampa, Florida. By December of 2016, Ihan was hired by the University of Southern Florida as an assistant professor in the School of Advertising and Mass Communications. He worked in this position for three semesters. Meanwhile, Laurel was a photographer and also worked as an instructor in the College of Communications at the same university. However, the marriage between Ihan and Laurel appeared to be a hostile one. By January of 2018, Laurel filed for divorce. 
We don't know too many details about why, but according to what some sources have reported, court documents know hostility and emotional abuse from Ihan towards Laurel. In one court hearing, Laurel described Ihan as erratic and unpredictable, with poor mental health that continued to worsen over time. After filing for divorce by July of 2018, the couple signed a parenting plan that granted them both 50-50 split custody of Ella. At the time, Ihan was living in a condo in Temple Terrace while Laurel was living in Lutz, Florida. However, as the months passed and they were going about their shared custody agreement, Laurel noticed Ihan showing increasingly concerning behaviors. There were times where Ihan would keep Ella for longer periods than he was supposed to or would be late to dropping Ella off. He would accuse Laurel of trying to keep Ella away from him, even though he was the one that was late to drop-offs. I want to note that even though Ihan had secured a contract with USF as an assistant professor, first of all, that contract was through Laurel. She was the one who got them both jobs there after moving from Turkey. But his contract ended in May of 2018, and it was not renewed, so for several months, Ihan was not employed. It was by September of 2018 when Laurel started getting increasingly worried that Ihan was going to take their daughter to Turkey and keep her there. So, Laurel took to the courts and filed a motion seeking to prevent Ihan from taking Ella out of the country altogether. In this court hearing, Ihan claimed that he was only taking Ella to Turkey so that she could visit his family, that there was nothing to worry about, he was going to bring her back. Ihan is a permanent citizen of the United States on a green card, but he did also have an apartment in Istanbul and it would be easy for him to get a job there and to just stay there with Ella. After all, he wasn't working in the United States. He didn't seem to have other family in the US. So, it really did make Laurel worried that he was planning on leaving and taking Ella with him. To this, Ihan stated that he was looking for a job in the US and he was actually in the process of applying for citizenship so he didn't have to hold the green card. He was not looking to stay in Turkey long term. He also mentioned that Laurel had denied him of his visitation time, which he had a right to according to the court documents, which I guess means that you get to take your daughter out of the country totally makes sense. By September 18th, the court did grant Laurel's motion, forcing Ihan to remain in the United States with Ella, barring him from leaving with her, even if it was just to visit family. The courts found that Ella was an abduction risk. By November, a judge ratified the parenting agreement and ordered both sides to continue adhering to it. But it seems that no matter what the courts ordered Ihan to do, he did not care. He was going to do whatever he wanted, regardless of the consequences. By December 3, 2018, the Florida Department of Children and Families Abuse Hotline received a call concerning the welfare of little Ella while under the care of her father. At the time, officers showed up and investigated the claims, but nothing was done. The Child Protection Unit at the Sheriff's Office determined that Ella was being appropriately cared for and no concerns were noted. But then, by December 5th, 2018, Laurel became extremely concerned when she got a call from Ella's school informing her that Ella hadn't shown up that day. Laurel then texted Ihan saying that it was her turn to have Ella and demanded that they immediately set up a meeting so she could pick Ella up. To this, Ihan responded, quote, don't push too hard, continuing, you owe me three previous days from two previous incidents where you kept Ella on my timeshare. I'm claiming my timeshare back as a compensation for those days. After Ihan refused to return Ella, Laurel filed an emergency motion with the courts stating that Ihan was breaching the custody agreement and requesting that an officer escort Laurel to pick Ella up from his home, stating that she feared for her own safety if she went to pick up Ella alone. She contacted her attorney, Damian McKinney, who then spoke with Ihan's attorney, Blair Chan. And what was being claimed at this time was disturbing. According to what Blair Chan told Laurel's attorney, Ihan was in the process of working with a child protection investigator because Ella apparently told her father that she had been touched inappropriately by her mother's partner. 
So Ihan was basically saying that Ella told him that she was being inappropriately touched by Laurel's partner at the time. He told his lawyer this and apparently got an investigator involved. So, Blair Chan informed Damien McKinney that Ihan had made the decision to keep Ella until a decision was made regarding whether a dependency hearing would be opened. He said that if it is determined that the claims are unfounded, Ihan will, of course, offer makeup time to Laurel. After learning this, Laurel got into contact with Jamie McKay, who is the child protection investigator on the case. Turns out, Jamie McKay actually emailed Laurel saying that she never told Ihan to withhold Ella from her. In fact, she told him that he needs to be following the court order as planned. So, he was supposed to send Ella back and continue as normal as the abuse investigation continues. All of this information that I just told you was included in the motion that Laurel was filing. The email from McKay stating that they were supposed to go through with the predetermined custody agreement, showing that he had no right to hold Ella any longer. She also wrote in the motion that Ihan is straight up fabricating these abuse allegations. The motion stated, quote, The father has a long history of pretending to care about the minor child when in reality, his main motivation is clearly to hurt the mother in any way possible, including by coaching the minor child to make false accusations of abuse. Continuing, The father is only refusing to return the minor child for a warped sense of satisfaction that he has disrupted the mother's life. She continued to write in the motion that Ihan is showing increasingly erratic behaviors, showing that his mental health health was rapidly declining. By December 6, the court ruled an order requiring both parties to abide to the parenting plan. They did not order a police pickup. Instead, they just contacted Ihan, who told them that everything was just fine and he was going to follow through. So, they did not force Ihan to give Ella back. Instead, the court order was put for him to return Ella on his own accord fining him $50 for every day he refused to do so, which to me is pretty ridiculous. He could keep her for a week and still only owe $350, which if you're really desperate, that is not a lot of money. It's literally less than a speeding ticket. And we saw just that in the days that followed this emergency custody hearing. It didn't matter what orders were placed. It did not matter what fines were threatened. Ihan was going to continue doing whatever he wanted regardless of the consequences. That same day, Laurel and Ihan did speak on the phone and it was known that Ella was alive, but we don't know the details of this conversation. We don't know what was said or Ihan's state of mind or truly what was going on within the home at that time. For the four days that followed, Ihan continued to ignore his orders. According to Barry Friedman, Laurel's father and Ella's grandfather, Laurel continued to try and get into contact with Ihan for those four days, but was getting absolutely no response. Now, I do want to note that throughout all of this, Laurel was never really concerned that Ihan was going to hurt Ella. She thought that his love for her was enough to keep her safe, that really he just wanted to have his daughter and make Laurel hurt, but she never really thought that he was going to harm Ella. She was more concerned that he was going to harm her. But still, with all of this that was going on, with the four days without any contact, she was getting increasingly concerned as well as frustrated with the authorities because he was ordered to return Ella and was still refusing to do so. Yet still, even after he continued to blatantly refuse to follow the orders, no emergency pickup was made, no authorities were dispatched to Ihan's home to ensure he followed through, the order was given, he was threatened with a $50 fine, but that was it. Finally, by around 4 p.m. on December 10th, Laurel called the police and requested that officers do a welfare check. When they arrived to his condo, they knocked on the front door but got no answer. So, the officers went around to the back of the condo and there, they made their first horrific discovery. They found 48-year-old Ihan Aids deceased in his home. According to documents, he was hanging from a rafter on the inside of his screened patio. 
there was a thin green robe tied around his neck and a plastic bag wrapped around his head. He was dressed in a black suit and dress shoes. His body was facing a framed photo that was sitting on a table of himself and Ella sitting on his lap. After making their way inside the home, they entered the front bedroom of the condo, and there they found three-year-old little Ella lying on her back in the bed, deceased. She was wearing a pajama shirt, and the covers were pulled up all the way to her neck. She was found with her arms extended above her head with her palms facing up. There was a small stuffed animal in her left hand and a stuffed crescent moon near her left hand on the bed. In her right hand, there was a piece of paper which showed pictures of unicorns. At the time, investigators found no obvious signs of trauma to little Ella's body. However, she was in a state of early decomposition. Of course, after the discovery of these two bodies, they were sent off to the medical examiner for autopsies. There, the medical examiner determined that Ihan's death was a suicide and three-year-old Ella's death was a homicide. However, reporting on this case is very minimal, so after the initial 2018 and 2019 articles, I haven't seen any further information regarding their cause of death, so we still don't know Ella's official cause of death or even her time of death. Sources have stated that police looked into a neighbor's doorbell camera footage to see if they could gather any more information about what occurred in the days leading to their deaths, but again, no further information on that has ever been released. I will say again that we know Ella's body was in a state of decomposition, and it has not been stated that Ihan was decomposing at all, so that makes me think that Ella was killed at least a day or two before Ihan took his own life, but there's no way to know for sure. We do know, I mean, we can at least deduce that Ihan killed Ella and then he killed himself, but we don't know exactly how long of a period there was between when he killed his daughter and then took his own life. As for the cause of death, the fact that there was no visible trauma, you can speculate, but I will leave that up to you because I don't want to sit here and try to decide what I think her cause of death was because no matter how she was killed, it's absolutely horrific what happened. Either way, going back to the scene of when police found the bodies. After walking into the condo, investigators found a typed seven-page letter near the back sliding door of the condo placed on a desk. This was a supposed suicide note. The letter was not addressed to anyone in particular, but it was dated December 6th, on the same day that Ihan was ordered to return Ella. On that desk where the letter was found, Ihan's computer was open and on, open to a page that showed his email inbox. The last email in his inbox had been opened and was that December 6th order sent from his lawyer. The email read in part, case status as a follow-up to our call this morning. I encourage you to comply with temporary order and exchange the child with the mother today. So based on that information, we can pretty much gather that he read this email and then immediately decided that Ella was never going to see her mother ever again. Now, when it comes to the letter, the letter itself has never been released. However, sources state that it discusses the separation, the divorce, and child custody matters between the two. But in the very last line of the letter, before Ihan signs his name, it says, I cannot imagine a life for myself and Ella to go through this nonsense for the rest of our lives. Basically, it seems like Ihan was blaming Laurel for everything that was happening in their marriage and with keeping Ella away from him and making them struggle with these transfers between the two and having to share custody. We can clearly see that his mental health truly was deteriorating as Laurel said it was and this caused him to spiral. He wasn't going to be allowed to have Ella to himself. He wouldn't be allowed to leave the country with her and live with his family, which by the way, I do think he planned to stay in Turkey with her to keep her from Laurel and at that point, it would have been very difficult for authorities to get her back. But when he wasn't allowed to do that, he tried just keeping her in his condo. It appears that he made up allegations that Ella was being hurt in her mother's home, hoping that the authorities would order her to stay with him. But when none of that worked, 
he decided that if he couldn't have her all to himself, that nobody could have her. In his final act of control, he went out of his way to hurt Laurel by taking away the one thing in this world she cared the most about. That is my opinion, of course. Ihan is not alive today to tell his side of things. We also don't know exactly what he wrote in that suicide letter. It was seven pages, so I'm sure there was a lot of information about what his state of mind was like and what he thought about everything, but truly... I don't really think it matters because I don't think he ever cared that much about Ella. I think everything he did was to exert his power and control over Laurel. I think he just wanted to hurt her. So he did everything in his power to take Ella away from her, knowing how badly it would hurt. I don't think he tried to keep Ella to himself because he loved his daughter that much or because he truly believed that she was being abused so he wanted to flee the country with her to get her away from her mom. Because if he did love his daughter, he would understand that a little girl needs her mother and the most healthy situation for her is to have both loving parents in her life who don't use each other as weapons, who don't talk badly about each other, and who just try their best to co-parent and support their child the best way possible. That is what is most healthy for the child, and that is what parents should be focused on when they're going through a divorce and separation like this, but unfortunately, that's not usually what happens. In the aftermath of this, obviously, Laurel and the rest of Ella's family are completely devastated, they are infuriated that the Hillsborough Sheriff's Department didn't do more to protect Ella. In a statement after Ella's death, Laurel said, quote, These events are painful to recount, but it is tremendously important to make clear that my daughter Ella was failed by multiple entities that had responsibility for protecting her. I sought help from people in positions of authority over the course of several days, repeatedly voicing escalating concern for Ella's safety. She noted that the police department failed to take her concerns seriously despite her concerns for Ihan's declining mental health and erratic behaviors. Laurel continued in her statement, quote, Ella was a kind, empathic, and bright child who should be alive today. My family and I are deeply grieving this devastating loss. When I am able, I will join my voice and energy to discussions of domestic violence and systemic failures to protect vulnerable children. As of right now, that is all of the information I have on today's case. Obviously, this was a tragic one that should not have happened the way it did. It's absolutely infuriating when courts just ignore pleas from parents who are concerned for their child's safety. Not only that, but instead of just having an officer escort Laurel to pick up Ella, they strongly suggested that Ihan comply with the court orders. I'm sorry, but if someone is breaking a court order and someone else is concerned for the safety of a child, that should be enough for an officer to pick up the child. I cannot wrap my head around how he was allowed to go four additional days without anybody checking in. I do personally believe that at least Ella was killed on December 6th after learning of the decision, so I don't know if anything could have been done after that to save her. But what I do know is that when the decision was made, he should have been forced to hand her over, not just leave it up to a man who is already in the process of breaking a court order. He clearly doesn't have any regard for the order if he is already ignoring it. $50 fines are not going to change his mind. And if something was done that day, such as officers going to his home to confront him, Ihan might have still been alive and could have been arrested to face what he did. Instead, he killed his daughter and then took the coward's way out to avoid having to take accountability for his actions. It's just so frustrating to see cases like this one continue to happen. The family hopes that Ella's story can serve as an example of how concerning it truly is when someone like Ihan is showing such a rapid decline in his mental health and that it should be taken seriously immediately. These reports should be followed up on and enforced, especially when the person is already ignoring them. But with that being said, that is all I have for today's case and now I want to know what you all think. Why do you think Ihan did this? Do you agree with me that it was all about control? What do you think of the courts and police response? Do you think this could have been prevented? 
Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn those notification bells too on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow the link down below and head to nurex.com slash Rachel Shannon to get started with your skincare journey today. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.